Let me ask you a question. When you heard those, that scripture read tonight, what did you think about? Well, as I, as I thought about it, I thought about how sometimes preachers say, I want to say one other thing, and, that, and the sermon's coming to another. But just before I finish, let me say one other thing. One other thing sometimes runs 10 minutes, doesn't it? You know, uh, it does for me. I'm not sure about other preachers, but that one other thing becomes sometimes maybe one and a half or maybe one and nine tenths other, other things and everything. How many times have you heard people say, and when Peter got to the end of his sermon, he said, repent and be, or you, you've crucified the Son of God, repent and be baptized uh, for the promises to you and to your children and to them that are far off. I love that next verse. And with many other words. <laughs> Peter got to the end of his sermon. He says, let me say one more thing. And what he said was, save yourself from this perverse generation. We'll come back to this in just a minute, but let me ask you this. What do you think of when you hear the word pervert or perversion? Isn't that a remarkable thing? It, it, it really is. Go ahead and turn the slides on because tonight I want us to talk about non-sexual perversion. You know, uh, uh, but to introduce this, how do you feel whenever you hear the word pervert? It is perversion, and we think about sexual perversion, but have you ever thought that adultery is just a sexual perversion just like homosexuality is? It is sex being used in a way, in a perverted way that God never intended for it to be used. And yet we have an abhorrence, do we not, when we when we read about the molestation of little children and everything, you understand that? When we read about, you know, uh, uh, read about rape and that type of thing, how do you feel about that? Is there, is there an emotion stirred within you, perhaps, perhaps because you've known of individuals that, that uh, endured that kind and maybe you had that very experience in your own life? How do you feel about it? It just seems to me like. That for one to hear of a, of a sexual perversion of a little child, it just, mm, it just makes you so you just want to, I don't know, it just makes you want to, mm, is that a good word? I don't know how you sign, mm, but uh, I'm looking to see how you sign it. Oh, it's, mm, I just checked it and I saw how to do it, okay? That's great. And that's the way we ought to feel about that. Here's a, here's a point of tonight's lesson. Let's see how God uses the word perversion. Let's look at the divine use of this because tonight's lesson will talk about God's discussion of non-sexual perversion. It's real interesting. Save yourself from this perverse generation. This sermon, uh, the, th the thoughts of this sermon came from thinking about the last sermon that Moses ever preached and reading the last sermon that Moses ever preached. You know what it talks about? A perverted nation. You got your Bible? We're not going to put the verses on the screen. You, you, may, you may want to just open your Bible and, and look at this. You might even want to underline the word pervert or, per or the word perversion in relationship to it because Moses is dying. Whenever he finishes this, uh, his last sermon in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and, 30, uh, uh, 32 and 30, uh, 33, God says, Moses, that's it. Come up to the mountain, you're about to die. And so Moses is talking to them. And it's the last sermon that Moses will ever preach. And I love analy analyzing it. And you look at those first uh, five verses or so, and, and it just talks about the, uh, the, the goodness of God and how God has been, God has been good. He says in, in verse 31, Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and hear them, O earth, the words of my mouth. Let my sayings drop from, uh, as the rain, 
and speech as the dew, as, as uh, raindrops on the tender herb and as showers on the grave. For I proclaim the name of the Lord. And then he says, for I proclaim the name of the Lord. I ascribe greatness to our God. He's the rock. His work is perfect. All of his ways are just. And then, or justice, he said. He's a God of truth without injustice. And then look in verse 5. They have perverted themselves, the King James says. They have corrupted themselves. They are not his children because they blemish, and here's the word perverse, a perverse and crooked generation. They've corrupted themselves. What's he talking about? Israel. It's not sexual perversion under discussion here. You sit down and you analyze this last sermon and he talks about the goodness and the mercy of God and all that God has done for them. He says in verse 7, would you please remember some things about God? This is a nation that had come out of the land of Egypt. Many of them uh, had already deceased by the time Moses uh, uh, were, uh, uh, delivered this final speech. But there were those who were, who were under year, 20 years of age, and they could remember all of this. They could remember how good God was and how He led that nation out of the land of Egypt. And He says, you need to remember this thing because if you don't do it, the judgment of God is coming on perversion. Now you hear that. It's not just sexual perversion. The Bible does in other places use other words to talk about the judgment of God coming on, on sexual perversion. But that's not, that's not the case right here. Look down when you get down to verse 5, whenever he says, the Lord says, well, starting in verse 19, chapter Deuteronomy 32, verse 19, and when the Lord saw it, he spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and daughters and said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be because they are a perverted generation. They are a perverse generation. What had happened? They had enjoyed the blessings of God for the last 40 years. You know, they didn't have to work very much for the last 40 years. You stop and think about it. You know, uh, uh, they had Uber delivering them, delivering them uh, their groceries, you know, every uh, six days of the week. They just went out there and there was just laying all over the place. And they didn't have to go clothes shopping. They never had to think, well, I need some new clothes. For, for 40 years there in the wilderness, they didn't have to even go buy a new pair of shoes. Why? God is just so good to them. And when they were thirsty, he gave them uh, water out of the rocks. You remember those two occasions that the Bible details. You remember, <coughs> remember that when the water was bitter, he, correct, he, did, he uh, corrected the water and gave them pure water to drink out there. And he gave them quails. And I remember, and I say this for the benefit of you young men, that uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Bible says they ate those quails until the quails ran out their nostrils. Well, I don't know if you grew up in Alabama, but I preached a sermon about as a young preacher. They ate, <laughs> Rose and Bloom, I see you smiling about that. They ate those quails until they ran out their ears. It, and, and I preached that, and somebody kindly says, Dan, it was the nose, not the ears. Somewhere in the past, you know, my mother would say, you keep eating that much, it'll start running out your ears. And now he gets up and gets involved in your preaching. How good was he to them? And yet they saw all of the blessings of God. And what did they do? Well, we're not able to go into that promised land. Is that a perversion of grace and mercy? Look at that nation. And the Bible describes that nation <clears throat> as being perverse. There's an interesting story in, in Luke, chapter 40, uh, Luke chapter 9. And that is 
the faithless Jews, and it may not just be the apostles, it may be that entire nation, because in Luke chapter 9, you get to verse 41, you'll see the word perversion or uh, uh, perverse in relationship to that. But you, but you look in Luke chapter 9, and they, they said to, uh, they came to Jesus, and on the next day, starting, starting back in verse 20, uh, 27, I guess, it, um, uh, well, well, let me get, get the right verse there. Page is turned down. Verse 37, now to happen, on the next day when they came down from the mountain, the great multitudes met him. And suddenly a man cried out saying, teacher, I implore thee, look on my son, my only child. A spirit seizes him and he throws himself into the fire. And you know the details about of this. He's bruising himself. So I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered and said, and it looks like he's talking about more than just the apostle. Oh, faithless generation. How long shall I be with you and near you, bring your son to me. What's wrong? It's a perversion of life not to have faith in God. Isn't that amazing? Here they were in the very presence of God and in the presence of Jesus, the Son of God, and he looks and sees everything that is involved in this, but he said, you are a perverse generation. If you were a Bible student and you read this perverse generation, is it possible you might think of what Moses said in his last sermon? Twice he calls that nation a perverted generation. And Jesus himself Look at the, looked at the people of his day, and he described it as a perverted generation. Now, the text of our lesson, Acts chapter 2, Peter on the day of Pentecost says, you need to save yourself because the judgment of God pronounced in Deuteronomy chapter 32 is about to come. It is at hand, and it's coming on this generation. It is a perverted generation. But before coming back to that, let's take just a moment and let's look in the book of Proverbs. Let's see, let's see what Proverbs says uh, 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 about the matter of perversion. And there are far more verses than we have time to put into this lesson. But uh, you, you, you need to start in chapter 2, Proverbs chapter 2, verse 10, and we're trying to get to verse 12. That's the one that we want. When wisdom enters your heart and knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you. What's that mean? What kind of wisdom we're talking about? What kind, of, what kind of knowledge are we talking about? Is that not divine wisdom and divine knowledge? Is that not a magnifying of the, the wisdom of the words of the Bible and the knowledge that it imparts to us? And, and so he says, it's pleasant to your soul and discretion will, preser pre will preserve you to deliver you from the ways of evil from the man who speaks perverse things. You hear that? There were men who were speaking perverse things. That's not knowledge, is it? He's talking about wisdom and knowledge and it will help you in everything, but you need to understand there are some people that are speaking perverted things. Isn't that, isn't that remarkable? Now, the word perverse is not found in this verse, but the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter days, you know, men will depart from faith. They'll have itching ears, and they'll find teachers that will come along and tickle their itching ears. They won't love the truth, but they will love the message of those who pervert the message of God. 
And we talk about 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, and we need to, but it says uh, the man, about the man of God, and we ought, we ought to think about this, but 1 Peter 4, 11 says, if any man speak, I suspect since that word, you know, uh, uh, the man of God is in the background of this, if any man speak, let him speak as the words of God. Somebody told me as a young preacher, read a long scripture text to start your sermon. At least that much of it will be good. Isn't that amazing? And here we have this discussion. You, th you think about, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. You know that mathematical symbol, you young people. You still have that plus and minus sim symbol in math. You know what I'm talking about? I'm, 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 you'd be amazed how many times I read the Bible and I put a plus and a minus beside a verse. You take a positive statement and flip it over. You make a, you make a positive number, a negative number. In 1 Peter 4, 11, will you put the negative statement here? If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. You want to flip it over? And if he's not going to speak as the oracles of God, I guess this is almost a bad word to say in this modern generation, but I heard it a lot of times growing up. Let him shut up. Why? Because here is divine wisdom that comes. There is this divine knowledge that comes. But there are those. There is that man who speaks perverse things from those who leave the paths of uprighteousness to walk in the ways of darkness. When you walk away from preaching the light of the Bible to enlighten people about the ways of God, when you do not speak as the oracles of God, you are leading them in into darkness. And that's perversion. We need to understand that. I could look at several other verses that, that are there. If we'll quickly look at three, look at 332 in Proverbs. You're still there. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 32. For the perverse person is an abomination of the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the Lord. It's amazing. A perverse per person is an abomination to the Lord. Are we talking about sexual perversion here? Isn't that amazing? When one does not speak the words of the Lord, that's perversion. And we need to have the same abhorrence toward that, toward, toward that kind of preaching as we, as we, uh, you know, as we have toward, uh, you know, child molestation. It's perversion. It is a perverted gospel. Look at 424, we're in, we're in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4, verse 24. Well, let me just catch you guys up. You just walked in. We're talking about non-sexual perversion. And uh, the Bible talks, use it, we, we only use the word perversion and pervert to talk about uh, those uh, uh, sexual activity. The Bible uses it another way. And so in tonight's lesson, that's what we're talking about, is non-sexual perversion. And so you look into Proverbs, we're in the book of Proverbs chapter 4, verse 24. And look what he says. Put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips from you. Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you and ponder the path of your feet. Isn't that amazing? Deceitful mouth results and it comes from perverse lips. Now that does, that's not, we talk, we applied 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 11 to, to, uh, to, to the matter of preaching. But it's, it's true of any time, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. But here it is, <clears throat> that individual who is deceitful in relationship to this. Quickly, look in chapter 6 and verse 12. 
a worthless person, a, a wicked man, walks with a perverse mouth. He winks with his eyes. Isn't that descriptive? I mean, you read the Bible slow enough, and I tell you, I, watch my eyes, though. I want you to look up here. I'm going to give every one of you a million dollars. I winked just what I did, okay? <laughs> that, that, isn't that amazing? Why? Being deceitful. It is being deceitful. Look in chapter 8 and verse 8, and then, then, then we've got to move on. They're, they've just, all the way through the book of Proverbs, I, I just, uh, I, I sort of just lay these down here in order so it make it easy. Look at verse 8, chapter 8, verse 8. All the words of my mouth are with righteousness. Nothing crooked or perverse is in them. They are all plain to him who understands, who finds knowledge. Wow. You've got to be, how, who was it? Was it Nathaniel? You remember Nathaniel that was brought to Jesus? Philip brings his brother. You remember Nathaniel? And when Jesus sees Nathaniel, he says, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. You know what that means? Deceit. And, and, and we need to, need, need to be the kinds of people that what we say with our lips is exactly where we are with our hearts. It is perversion to not speak the words of truth. If you're in chapter 8, look at verse 13. You'll, you'll see it again in verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogance and the evil away and the perverse mouth I hate. Why does somebody lie to you? Why does somebody lie to you? Many times lies are given deceitfully. It is a perversion not to speak truth. Let's look at uh, two more and then we'll stop this part of the lesson. We're not near the end of the sermon. We're just stopping this part of it about, about perversions in Proverbs. Look in chapter 16, verse 28. Here's the word perverse again. 16, 28, whenever he says, Starting in verse 20, 12, uh, 27, an ungodly man digs up evil, and it is on his lips like a burning fire. A perverse man sows, dis sows strife, and a whisperer separates friends. You know what gossip is? Perversion. What do you gossip about? When are you talking about other people? What are you gossiping about? I want to tell you something. Don't you tell anybody what I'm saying. You've got their attention. A whisper separates friends. And we need to understand the danger of using our lips to tell bad things about other people. It is remarkable how sometimes we'll not let the past, that the things that's happened in the past of individuals' life that they have fully repented of, we'll hold it over them perhaps the rest of their life. And every time we, we, uh, uh, we think about, well, you know what he did one time? What's that? He's tearing down the character and the reputation of that other individual and that is as wrong as it can be. Listen, that's perversion. That is perversion. And chapter 23, verse 33, you, you, you know Proverbs chapter 23 that talks about the, the, the matter of, of drink and everything. When, when it, it, does not the chapter begin, uh, uh, talk about, uh, the, at least that, this part of the chapter, about drinking and, and alcohol, starting in verse 39, or verse 29, chapter 23, verse 29, who has woe, who has sorrow, who has contentions, who has complaint, who has wounds without cause? And then it says, those who linger long at the wine, those who go search for, mix, for mixed drink, listen to this, wisdom, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it's sparkling in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. 
God says, it'll bite you like a, like a, like a serpent. And how many lives have been ruined because people were drinking? How many times have there been woe and sorrow and contentions and complaints and wounds? But you begin looking at it. At the last, it bites like a serpent, stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Isn't it amazing? The danger of being perverted when you're drunk when you've been drinking. That's what this is talking about. I'm not talking about sexual perversion. I'm just talking about things that you do and things that you say. You begin drinking your inhibitions that control your actions from the very first drink. It lessens your resolve and you become a different person. The more you drink, the, 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 the more loss of the control that you have. That's perversion. That's not what, why God made wine on this earth. Let's look at uh, then the perverse nation on Pentecost. Acts 2, we found perverse nation in Moses' life speech. It's near the end of the nation of Israel. Peter on the day of Pentecost says, judgment of God is coming and you need to save yourself from this perverted generation. Isn't that amazing? What have they done? Called him a blasphemer? Called him Beelzebub? They perverted the words of their mouth and lied about him to find two men that would disagree and they were able to bring charges of him against him? misrepresented what he said when he said, tear down this temple and in three days it'll be raised up. Perversion. And then they killed the Son of God. What would you do if somebody killed your son? Now, when you get the answer to that, then take the, the feelings that you have in relationship, somebody killing your child, and understand that's what they did to God Almighty. And God brought the worst tribulation there's ever been on this earth or ever will be on that wicked and perverted generation, and it was going to happen in that generation. That's what Matthew 24 talks about. The worst tribulation there's ever been, nor ever will be, whenever not one stone of this temple is left upon another. And you need to understand that. When God gets angry, a nation is perverted. I want to ask you something. What is the difference between the perversion and lies they told about Jesus? And what was broadcast to the world, perhaps to a billion people, mocking Jesus at the Last Supper and transgenders being around him at that table. Wow. We live in a sick, sick world. And how many people tried to justify that very action? If you saw it, you didn't have to tell you it was perverted. As you saw it, something's wrong about all of this because it was perversion. And the point is, we too live in a perverted world. Let's close this lesson by looking at Philippians chapter 2. The word perverse is found there. Here's a, here's a letter written to, the, to those New Testament Christians. They were those who were alive during the time of that, of that very generation. Save yourself from this perverse generation. And so when you get to Philippians chapter 2, Paul says, 
Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own fear or salvation with fear and trembling. It's God who works in you to do His will and, 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 to do for, and, and to do for His good pleasure. Don't murmur, don't complain, don't dispute, that you may be blameless. Here's the application of the lesson. Don't you be perverted in any of the things we've talked about tonight, that you may be blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. What a lesson of application to us. There's never been a time that we've not lived in a time like this of perversion. And then he says, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I've not run in vain or labored in vain. Isn't that amazing? What's our responsibility? in a perverted nation? Don't you try to see how close to that darkness you can get and try to get over that gray area. We sang it as a child, didn't we not? All around the neighborhood, I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan get out. I'm going to let it shine. Folks, that's not a children's song. The thought is, let your light so shine before men that they'll glorify your Father. Let's live holy lives. Let's be blameless. But let's try to have the same aversion toward perversion as God sees perversion, as we do towards sexual perversion. I want you to know there's an unperverted way to go to heaven. You know why? I'm going to speak as the oracles of God. If, if you want to go to heaven, you need to believe in Jesus. You need to understand that John 3.16 says, Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's not perversion. That's truth. You need to see that unperverted way of salvation whenever we talk about repenting of your sins. Acts chapter 17, he has commanded, he has appointed him, uh, God now commands all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world by that righteous one, Jesus. That's amazing. That's not perversion. You've got to repent. You've got to change your life. And you need to live a life that bears the fruits of repentance. Repentance is not something that you just do before you're baptized. You do it before you're baptized, but it's a change of mind that brings about a change of life the rest of your life. And that confession that you made before you were baptized, are you aware in the Greek, the first time that word is used, is used in talking about one time, about confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. The second time, it talks about in the present tense of just keeping on, keeping on, keeping on. You confess with your mouth that you believe Jesus is the Son of God so that you can become a Christian. And every day of your life, you have a chance to tell others about Jesus and thereby confess him before men long after you re re confessed him before you were baptized. Confession is something that continues the rest of your life. And then you need to be baptized that your sins might be uh, blotted out and that you, so that you will not be a part of this perverted generation. Interesting approach. I hope you found it interesting. Non-sexual perversion. Let's sing this song of invitation. It might be you've been thinking about becoming a Christian. 
You ought to do it tonight. I don't know of any reason you, I, I don't know of any, any profound reason that you should not obey the gospel tonight. Do you? Why would you not want to get ready to go to heaven tonight? You know, you might die tonight. Wouldn't, you, wouldn't it be great to die the day after you're baptized or the night after you're baptized? In fact, I remember as a child thinking, I wish somebody would hit me in the head as I came out of the baptistry. Then I might have had a chance of going to heaven. That's a child's wrong view of grace and mercy. God wants me in heaven as much today or more than he did back then. You need to understand grace. But if you cannot live away from God and you need to have a relationship to God and be baptized into Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? And you could do that tonight. We've got water here, we've got clothes here, we've got towels and everything. And then you just got to keep on keeping on. Our world, in all likelihood, is going to add sin to sin. And if you think America is bad, just wait around and see where we are in the, in the future. If we keep going the direction we've been going as a nation for the last, you know, five decades or more. God help us. And if we can help you go to heaven in any way, won't you let us know how we can do it? By coming to the front right now, as together we stand and sing. Will you come?